Hey, how's it going? It's Carlo from AYCB, and today I'm going to be showing you how to play Nadavalier. So this is a game with hidden bidding and card drafting. The idea is that the dwarf kingdom of Nadavalier is being threatened by the dragon Fafnir, and the king has appointed you to search across the different taverns and use your money to recruit the dwarves that will give you the best army in the hopes of defeating the dragon Fafnir. So stick around and let me show you how to play. We'll set up here for a four player game. Each player takes an individual player board and five of these basic red coins, a zero and the others two through five, along with a random gem from the ones available based on player count. Set up the three tavern signs for the laughing goblin, the dancing dragon, and the shining horse, then set up the gem trade markers and the royal treasure with matching coin values. Place all hero cards on three of the card holders like this, and the five distinction cards on the other holder. Then shuffle the age one and age two decks separately. Note the slight adjustments to set up for two, three, and five player games, which mostly involves cards that are used only for five player games, as well as some minor adjustments to the coins available in the royal treasure. So Nadavlier plays over the course of two ages, and each age will have a set number of turns. If you're playing a two or three player game, each age will have four turns, and if you're playing a four or five player game, then each age will have three turns. The game has five different types of dwarves, and they all score differently. So every round or every turn, you're basically going to be drafting one dwarf from each of the three taverns. Along the way, you'll be able to do other things like upgrade the value of your coins so you can make higher bids in future rounds and that sort of thing. Um, and basically, once everyone has drafted all their cards at the halfway point of the game, there's going to be a, a sort of an assessment period where you might gain some cards, which we'll go over afterwards. And then we're basically going to play out the second age till all the cards have been dra uh, drafted. And then at the end of the game, we'll just count up the points for the different uh, dwarves, the way they score, and the player with the most points wins. So before we get into the actual turn structure, I want to go over the five different types of dwarves and how they score. First, note that there are two different values that can be associated with all the cards. The bravery value, which is the number of points it'll score and then the rank, which is this colored strip here. First, let's talk about blacksmiths in purple. Each blacksmith card in both age decks is the same as their bravery value works as a mathematical sequence. One rank is three points, two is seven points, three is 12 points, and so on. So each rank you add is worth one more point than the previous one. Hunters in green. Hunters have a bravery value equal to the number of hunter ranks squared. So they start off less valuable than blacksmiths with your first one only being worth one point, but if you look down here, 10 ranks would get you 100 points, compared to 10 blacksmith ranks getting you 75. So hunters require a more long-term investment. Warriors, in red. Warriors have a bravery value equal to the sum of their total bravery points listed. However, when determining bravery values, the player with the majority in ranks in the warrior column adds their highest value coin to the total sum. Miners, in orange. Miners' bravery value is equal to the sum of their bravery points multiplied by the number of ranks. Explorers in blue. Explorers are straightforward. Their bravery value is simply the sum of their cards. Each turn will start by randomly dealing out cards face up from the appropriate age deck. Each tavern gets a number of cards equal to the number of players. Once this is done, players will each place three of their coins, one coin face down on each tavern space of their personal board as a secret bid, and their two remaining coins will go face down in their pouch, here. Once all players have placed their five coins face down, Bidding is complete and we move on to the tavern's resolution phase where all players reveal their bids simultaneously, one tavern at a time. So starting with the first tavern, the Laughing Goblin, in order from highest bid to lowest, players take turns drafting a single dwarf card from the matching tavern. Ties are broken by whichever player has the higher value gem. If you already have a dwarf of that type, add it to the same column. Otherwise, start a new column. After adding your dwarf card, if you complete a line, or a set, of all five dwarf types, you immediately recruit a hero card from the supply. Heroes boost the value of your army in different ways. Heroes can either correspond to one of the five types of dwarves and can be added to the respective columns, or they can be neutral heroes which you'll place in the command zone on the left of your board. Sometimes recruiting a hero card might complete another new line, meaning it can trigger recruiting another hero. In order to recruit a hero card, the number of your completed lines must be equal to the number of your hero cards plus one. There's a bunch of heroes in the game and some of them have some pretty involved abilities. You can find them all in the rulebook, but we'll go over a few of them here now. This symbol here on Dagda means you have to remove a dwarf card from the bottom of a column. Since there are two of these symbols, you'd have to remove one dwarf each from two different columns. If you previously gained a hero for completing a line and then removed a dwarf using this symbol, 
you do not trigger another recruitment when you complete that same line again. The Dwerg brothers are worth more points for the more of them you collect. Grid is worth 7 points at the end of the game, and she allows you to immediately upgrade a coin by a value of 7 when you recruit her. After you've potentially recruited any heroes, the next step of your turn would be that if your coin value you played was the zero with the little trade symbol on it, you would then trade a coin. In this case we did not, so the next player would draft a card, and then the next player, and then the final player would draft their final card. Uh, they did use the zero, so in this case they would upgrade a coin. Since the final player played their zero coin with this symbol, they'll trade a coin after drafting their card. To trade a coin, that player adds up the value of both coins in their pouch, in this case nine, and then upgrades the higher value of their two coins into a coin of that value from the royal treasure. Going forward, they now have these five coins for future rounds. If you upgraded a red coin, you just discard it for the rest of the game. If you upgrade a gold coin, you instead return it to the spot on the royal treasure. If there are no coins remaining in the royal treasure of the value required, take the highest value available. If there are no coins of equal or higher value, take the next lowest value instead. Coins can also be transformed by certain cards or abilities, such as this Royal Offering card, of which there are a few mixed into each deck. When a player gains this card, it doesn't go into any Dwarf column. Instead, the card is immediately discarded, and that player immediately upgrades any one of their coins, aside from their zero, by that amount. You can upgrade a coin from your pouch, a tavern that has already been resolved, or a tavern that has not been resolved. After each player has already drafted a card from the tavern, any players who played coins of the same value will then be part of the trading gems phase, which works as follows. Basically, the highest and lowest value gems will be swapped. Depending on player count, additional trades can happen, as shown below. Note that the special 6 value gem cannot be traded in this phase. The 6 value gem comes into play from the minor distinction, which we'll get to shortly. Once we've finished drafting all cards from all three of the taverns, that completes the turn. The next turn of the age will start by again dealing out the cards, and we'll go through that system again, uh, basically resolving all those turns until all turns of the age 1 have been completed. At the end of age 1, which signifies kind of the midway point of the game, there will be an assessment period where the king is going to award distinctions to any players who uh, stand out in any of the five classes of dwarves. So basically any player who has the majority in ranks in any specific category will earn a distinction card. If there's any ties for the most, then no player will get them. There are no tiebreakers for this. Um, the distinctions are always awarded in the following order. First, the king's hand for the majority in warriors. This just adds plus five immediately to one of your coins. Hunting master for hunters. Trade your zero value coin immediately with the special three value coin. This has the same trading properties, but now has a value of three instead of zero. Crown jeweler for majority and minors. Place the special value 6 gem on your current gem. This is worth 3 points at the end of the game, and in addition you now win all tiebreakers during the tavern resolutions phase for the rest of the game. King's Great Armorer, for the majority of blacksmiths. Immediately add this special blacksmith card with 2 ranks to your army. This may trigger a hero recruitment. Finally, Pioneer of the Kingdom, for majority in explorers. First, draw 3 cards from the age 2 deck. Keep one of them. If that card is a dwarf card, place it immediately in your army. If it's a royal offering card, transform one of your coins. The two unassigned cards are shuffled back into the age 2 deck. If no player wins this distinction, instead just discard the first card of the age 2 deck from the game. After you've finished awarding the age 1 distinctions, you just play through age 2 in the exact same way as you did with age 1, and then once all the cards are done being drafted, we get to final scoring. First, count points for each of the five classes as we went over earlier. Then, add up any points from neutral heroes, if any. Next, you'll add up the total sum of all your gold coins, including the one that you already counted towards your warrior's bravery value. If you have the special gem, gain 3 points for that as well. And the player with the most points wins. If there's a tie, well, honestly, the scores in this game are in the triple digits, often over two or 300, so it's super unlikely. Um, but if in any rare event that you actually do tie, you will unfortunately have to share the privilege of facing the dragon Fafnir together. And just to be clear, you don't actually face the dragon in this game. Winning the game just means you've earned the privilege to, uh, so maybe the actual fighting of the dragon will be in another game. But for now, that is how you play Nadavlier. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider liking the video, uh, subscribe to our channel if you like more videos of this sort. Otherwise, that's it for me, so thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.